Hey, welcome. Um, it's just turned 11 o'clock. Um, so welcome and thank you for joining today's um, ICS public event. Uh, my name's Sarah Deason. I'm the area director for the three health watch within Berkshire West, uh, which is Wokingham Borough, Reading and West Berkshire. Health watch, um, a key part of our role is to ensure that the public voice is listened to and taken into consideration when by the people who are making decisions about health and social care locally. So uh, that's that's our, our main reason. So that's why um, we're here today. Um, can I just introduce uh, my co-presenters? Um, um, we have Rob Bowen. Rob, can you, in, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, thank you, Sarah. Good morning, everybody. My name is Robert Bowen. I am the Deputy Director of Strategy at um, one of the NHS organisations across the area called uh, an Integrated Care Board. Thank you. Um, Tracy. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Tracy Daskovich. I'm the Director of Public Health for Berkshire West, so covering Wakenham, West Berkshire and Reading. Thank you. And Rob Beasley. Hi, I'm Rob Beasley. I'm the Interim Director for Communication and Engagement at the Buckinghamshire, Oxfordshire and Berkshire West Integrated Care Board. Thank you. OK, and we are also joined um, by our BSL interpreter today um, on, on the meeting. So um, it's a bit of housekeeping to start. Um, the meeting's virtual and open to anyone to attend. If you could um, mute your microphone um, during the meeting and raise your virtual hand if you'd like to ask questions when, when we get to that section of the meeting. Um, you can also post um, questions and comments in the chat, um, which we will pick up as we go. We'll hope, hopefully pick them up today, but if not, then we'll, we'll get back to you um, after, after the meeting. The, Recording will be published on the um, engagement portal. And, and so what that means is that the um, if you've got your camera on, obviously you, you will be seen on it. So please be aware of this when you, you participate. Um, there's a questionnaire. Um, so if you haven't already um, seen the um, questionnaire on the ICB website or your voice, um, then please do um, fill that in after the um, event today. The link for that will be going up in the chat during the meeting. Um, just a couple of other things. Um, if you can't see the slides right now, um, if you select view and then um, focus on control, then hopefully that should solve the issue. And also, if I can ask that you um, don't um, hit the take control button please because that disrupts the the slides um so i'm just asking for that too so so that's the that's the housekeeping so moving on then to the uh, program for today firstly we'll have a short presentation on the uh, proposed strategy and then we'll have time to get into the main purpose of the meeting which is to get your feedback and suggestions about what's good about the, the proposal, what's missing, uh, what could be improved, all things that can be used for the next version of the, of the strategy. Um, so on that um, note, I will hand over to Rob, who is going to do the uh, presentation for us. Thank you, Rob. Sarah, thank you for that introduction. Um, and before I get going on the detail of the presentation, I just want to acknowledge that the work that's been done uh, and pulling this strategy together has been a huge team effort. Um, uh, and there are some people that have been involved in pulling that together on the call today. So uh, a big thanks to them, but also thank you to all of you who are attending today. Um, this strategy will be much better and much stronger with the feedback that we're going to get through these sessions. Um, so it's it's really valuable that we uh, hear your opinions, as Sarah said, um, and and uh, listen to the feedback that you've got. So thank you for making the time this morning. Um, Erica, if we could flick through to the slides, that would be great. Um, so what, what I'll do in this presentation um, is just very quickly just give a little bit of explanation about what the strategy is and what it's for and how it's been developed and then a little bit about the content that's in the strategy. But hopefully you've had an opportunity to have at least a flick through the main document itself so you'll have a feel for uh, what's included. 
So the purpose of this document is really to set a common direction of travel for all of the organisations involved in the uh, in keeping our populations healthy and well. Uh, those populations that we're talking about are the populations across the geographical areas covered by Buckinghamshire, Oxfordshire and the three local authority councils in Berkshire West um, of West Berkshire, Reading and Wokingham. Uh, the, the strategy uh, has identified a number of priorities uh, and those priorities are about um, tackling things that we know are, uh, are areas where we could do more or we could work differently uh, to improve the health and well-being of those populations. But also recognising that as we come together as a group of organisations, uh, there might be things that we could do differently and better in terms of joint working, sharing learning, tackling problems. Um, so in terms of how we've developed this document, uh, we we started by having trying to get a very good understanding of what were the local plans, local strategies that we had in place across the uh, across the area. And those formed the foundation of what it was that we were setting as our ambition. Uh, and this strategy aims to build on those things and not replace them. So it's really important that this document is not meant to be describing absolutely everything that we will do. It's describing a number of priorities where we know those are a priority in terms of the local health and well-being of the populations or areas where we could work differently together. The priorities have been developed by really collaborative joined working between the different organisations and representatives from a variety of different backgrounds um, to help us to understand what are the things that we can do that would have greatest impact. Um, let's flick on to the next page. So when we looked at what it is that we wanted to try and achieve, we started by trying to understand more about the population um, and the communities that we had within that uh, big geographical area. We've got nearly two million people, um, but that is a population that is growing, it's getting older. Um, and actually, as we look at some of the, uh, the measures of people's health, uh, we understand that there are a number of measures where people are actually getting less healthy. Um, so there's there's really important work to be done. We also know that there's significant variation between our populations. We are not all the same. Uh, and so we need to think differently about the way in which we uh, provide support for people, provide care, provide health care. Um, and it's important to recognise that some of those uh, are to do with the circumstances in which we live. Uh, there are approximately 60,000 people within our area um, who live in communities that are categorised within the uh, in, with levels of poverty that fall within the lowest 20% across the whole of England. Um, uh, whilst recognising that actually within our communities there are some populations that are in uh, much wealthier areas. So there's a real discrepancy in the in the populations and communities that we've got. And we see that in some of the health metrics in terms of life expectancy, uh, years in good health. So we need to be thinking carefully about the way in which we plan and deliver our services. And the way that we do that, there are lots of different organisations that are involved in uh, planning and delivering health and care uh, across the Buckinghamshire, Oxfordshire and Berkshire West area, which we call Bob. Uh, and this strategy is aiming to provide that common set of priorities, that common set of directions on behalf of all of those organisations. Uh, and coming together under the banner of something called an integrated care partnership. We have a, a, a group of representatives from those different organisations who have got a responsibility for setting that strategy uh, and that um, direction of travel. So what is that direction of travel that we've uh, that we've set? Um, if we flick on to the next slide, 
uh, we we started by trying to describe sort of a high level ambition that we've did, we've got as our vision. Um, but then really importantly, uh, we've got some principles that we see uh, flowing through all of the different priorities that have been identified. And, and it's worth pausing on those principles. So those principles are around uh, preventing ill health. So trying to keep people as well as we can for as long as we can. As I said before, recognising that there is really significant variation in terms of how people access, experience uh, the services that we are providing. Um, and so we want to do more to uh, tackle those inequalities that we are aware of. Uh, thirdly, thinking about the way in which those services are designed and doing more working with individuals and communities to ensure that the services that we provide are tailored and bespoke as much as possible uh, to meet specific needs of communities. And the last two balance um, the, uh, the, the challenge that we've got of trying to do as much as we can, as locally as we can, but then taking advantage of uh, scale uh, of the the collaborations that we've got across our geographical area. In terms of the detail of the priorities, we've grouped those under five different themes. Um, so the next slides uh, indicate what those themes are. So our first theme is, is around um, trying to uh, keep people healthy. Um, so we've called that promoting and protecting health, but essentially it's trying to keep people healthy. We, we know that as we look at uh, people's health, probably only about 20 to 25 percent of that is actually directly related to the way in which people access and use formal care and healthcare services. A much greater influence on people's health uh, comes from the circumstances in which people live. Um, so they're uh, social circumstances, economic circumstances, their environmental circumstances. Those are things that we know that there is more that we could do on if we work better together uh, to thinking about people's uh, housing, the access to green spaces. Um, uh, and and so, so there's much more that we want to do around some of those other things that impact people's health. But those circumstances also influence people's behaviours and the choices that people make. Uh, and those choices are not always things that uh, are good for their health. Um, so we want to do more to try and influence uh, the choices that people are making, particularly around uh, choices that are impacting people's health. So thinking about reducing smoking, harmful levels of drinking, uh, levels of activity, healthy diet, and what that means in terms of a healthy weight. Our second theme is uh, about understanding that the the foundation for all of our health and care as we grow as uh, as um, children into adults, that foundation is set throughout our childhood. It starts right at the beginning in terms of uh, a healthy pregnancy and particularly in terms of some of the development that we have in our earliest years. So we have identified a priority around trying to do the best that we can to give all of the children within our area the best possible start in life. Um, and that's around those uh, early years, maternal health, but also thinking about some areas of particular challenge. So uh, thinking about the support that we provide to children who struggle in terms of mental health and well-being, uh, some of the particular and specialist support that we provide for uh, children and their families who have uh, special educational needs or disabilities. The, the third theme is thinking about uh, what can we do that will prevent ill health. Um, so this is about trying to think about uh, that there are a number of diseases or conditions that people uh, will have. What can we do that will uh, prevent the onset of those things or, or delay uh, the progress of those conditions? Um, and as we've looked at the, the conditions that we wanted to prioritise here, we uh, have uh, prioritised 
cardiovascular disease, mental health and cancer. Those are three areas where we know that there is more that we can do by working differently together, but also by encouraging uh, different behaviours, um, earlier support for individuals uh, who are at highest risk, recognising that some of those communities uh, are our most vulnerable people and most vulnerable communities, so being targeted about the services that we provide. The fourth theme uh, is recognising that as uh, our populations and people get older, uh, the challenges that they face change. Um, so there is there is more that we want to do to be able to support people as they are getting older and to help people to stay healthier and to stay independent for as long as possible. And that that recognises that there, there are things that we can do to help people uh, manage those conditions I spoke about differently, uh, to provide technologies or to provide support for people to understand how they can look after themselves as they uh, as they their conditions become more complex, but also recognize that actually as um, providers as formal of formal services and support, be that through the NHS, through our local authorities, through some of our voluntary care organizations, there's more that we can do that uh, mean that we provide care in a more joined up way. Um, and then there's recognising the important work that our carers do uh, and trying to find ways to support uh, our carers better. The final theme is the theme of access to our quality services. We know that that's a challenge. It's something that we read about uh, daily in our newspapers at the moment. Uh, and so here we want to think about um, what are the ways in which we can support people to access the right support in the right way in the most timely way possible um, by thinking about the support that we provide really at a very local level uh, and thinking about the different roles uh, and avenues of support that people can access and being really coordinated about that in terms of the neighborhoods and local teams but also recognizing that there will be times when people need uh, ac to access other formal services um, so trying to be very coordinated about uh, the way in which we are reducing the weights to some of our planned services and then thinking a bit differently about some of the uh, the ways in which we can um, help people to get to the right services, particularly around urgent care when they've got urgent needs. Um, that doesn't mean that always we are uh, using A&E or going to our GP or calling 999, but trying to think about uh, the different ways that that support could be provided. So those are the five thematic areas. I'm, I'm going to stop at this point and maybe come back to next steps at the end of the at the end of the session so we can talk about what we're going to do with this information. Um, hopefully that was a helpful trot through it. Uh, if people have got questions or feedback on on that, uh, it'd be really valuable to get that from you now. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Um, so um, over over to, to you. Um, any um, questions, um, put them in the chat or um, raise your hand and um, we'll put the questions to the panellists and the feedback. I can't can't see anyone. Oh, there we are. Thank you, Carol. Yes, thank you. I'm just getting used to where the buttons are on this. Uh, <laughs> yeah, system. they move every week. Yeah, from the ones I normally. Have. Yes, um, thank you for your uh, exposition there. It was very interesting. Um, my, I'm. Uh, live in Ditcot and I'm part of a group called Ditcot Against Austerity and we've been trying for a number of years to see if we can get some kind of urgent care facility in Ditcot for our growing population. We used to have a minor injuries unit. It was fairly basic, I think. It went some years ago, but we were thinking our nearest uh, urgent care is Abingdon or if not, then it's the JR. And we're a big population now, and we were thinking that what Ditcot really needs is to have some kind of urgent care actually in the community. But 
Uh, my question is not about that, really. Um, my question is about how do we tell the people that are now moving into Dipcot, buying ho houses in Dipcot, that they cannot register for a doctor? Because all three doctor surgeries, as far as I'm aware, have closed their lists to new residents. So, and Dipcot is growing. Uh, we've got uh, houses being built all the time. Who is telling those people they cannot register with a doctor? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rob Bowen, would you like to take that first? Great. Um, so, Carol, thank you for flagging that um, uh, really important topic to to raise in in terms. And, and what I will I'll take away that as some feedback to sort of feed into colleagues that are involved in how, how we are planning some of our urgent care services and support and some of the um, work that we're doing around planning primary care services and, and general practice. For the purposes of this strategy, we absolutely recognise that there are challenges around accessing uh, some of our formal support, uh, some some of our formal services. So that that last theme, uh, I think, is where we are trying to recognise that there is more that needs to be done uh, to support better access. And and there's a variety of things that we're proposing there in this strategy. Uh, which is a mixture of things that are very much about trying to understand and meet local needs through more integrated teams uh, of of individuals who can provide that support, um, but also thinking differently uh, about the way in which across all of other different um, types of organisations that are part of this partnership, uh, how we can work differently to provide support, particularly for those people that do need urgent care support. Um, so that that is very much one of the priorities that we have identified that we need to address uh, through this strategy. Thank you, Rob. Um, Rob Beasley, did you want to add anything in terms of communications? Uh, not specifically about people arriving in the in the uh, in a, a sort of new arrivals into the into the area. I, I, I'm I'm not sure that that's something which that's something that we would be directing uh, to, to, well we would be trying to directly communicate with individuals doing that. Um, but um, we are trying to make sure that people are aware about what what primary care services are available. I mean there is a, a national shortage of GPs at the moment that um, that people need to that needs to be addressed. Um, and we will continue just to make sure that people are aware about how they can find out that information. Thank you, and thank you, Carol, for your question. Um, moving on, um, Mark, uh, have your hand up. Hi there, um, it's Hello. Mark Russell. I'm Chief Executive of Age UK uh, Buckinghamshire, so I um, hope you don't mind me popping on the, the Berkshire version of this uh, to suit my diary. One question, um, it's really about volunteers. Obviously, you've recognised in the age well um, section of the uh, of the strategy the role that carers are um, playing and the important role they have in in helping this this system, as it were, work. Um, there's there's not there's not really any mention of the volunteers that across the board in the strategy and how they can also. Um, you know, be used and are doing a great job in, in managing some of the issues and, and priorities that you've got in the strategy. And I know you referenced the charities, so the, what was it, the 8,000 charities across the um, the organisation, but but just in Age UK's alone across Bob, I think we're looking at about 550 plus volunteers, some of whom are working with some of the most vulnerable older adults. I, I just wondered if you've had that feedback and, and whether or not you'd be wanting to acknowledge more specifically the role volunteers can play in some of the priorities that you've set out. So, Sarah, let, let me start, and then yes. Tracy may want to may want to add to it. Um, uh, as as we've been writing the strategy, we've tried to strike a, uh, a a balance in terms of describing what we think the priorities are versus how we think we'll deliver them. Um, so actually, one one of the things that we haven't said very much about is, is about staffing, recognising some of the staffing challenges that we've got. And as we look at that and the different ways that we might address that, the volunteer workforce is really, really important. Absolutely. Um, it's really helpful feedback to hear it like that. Um, 
And one of the things that we want to do as we're doing sort of the next iteration of this strategy to take it to a final version is to put some words in there around some of the things that we will need to do that will support delivery, um, which is uh, actually how do we do think differently now that we're lots of different uh, partners working across a slightly different geography? How do we think differently about uh, the staff that we have, the volunteers that we have? Um, to put to work better together to provide the best care and support that we can for our populations. So, so Mark, that's a really important point to make, um, and I think it is something that we'll try and factor in. Thanks, Rob. Um, yeah, and I just, just, you know, there's a lot of organisations, I guess, like ours, where we're developing strategies of our own, and we want to be able to integrate them into the wider ICP strategy. So. Um, those conversations will be really helpful because I want to be able to set something in motion and, and look forward three years knowing that there's structures in place where we can you know have those conversations I know there's the health alliance um, uh, work that's been done through Bob which I'm part of but it would be great to be able to um, make some plans of our own which we know are going to be receptively received through 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 the ICS if you know what I mean Yes, so so really really helpful, um, and and I think there are different ways to play into that. So one one is um, is is through things like this and trying to uh, make sure that we've got clarity about those priorities at a system level mm. and clarity about how we can work together on a system level. But I think there's also the uh, linking in with some of the local plans that are being developed through. What, what we're calling our place-based partnerships yeah. um, and, and being clear about actually what are, the, what are the ways in which the voluntary and community sector uh, can, will, will be playing a part in the delivery of some of those plans. Yeah, and I'll shut up now, but um, you know, for instance, we've got 200 volunteers. I would like to be training and developing those volunteers differently in the future, which will mean you know, more, more sort of intervention approach to some of the things we can do to help older adults and and what support there might be locally or through the wider Bob ICS to help train them in a way that suits your strategy as well as ours would be really good conversation to have. Great. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Okay, um, moving to the chat. Um, uh, priority for some things means loss of priority for others. Which serious service would you deprioritize, and how would you decide how to move resources from low to high priority? Um, Tracy or Rob, I don't, Tracy, would you like to? I'm really happy to start on this, and it yeah. links back um, to uh, the previous point as well. Uh, the, the conversation about volunteers is a really important one, and I, I think what we don't often do well. We we gather a lot of data and information within our systems, um, but we often miss out on that lived experience. And I think one of the conversations we need to start and have differently uh, with our communities and our voluntary sector colleagues, um, with that richness of intelligence we get from, from them, is that community conversation to help inform the way we do work, or as we often get bogged down in the detail of data, and we can often hit the target and miss the point entirely. So I think Mark's uh, the, the conversation starter there is a really important one, and it links into this in terms of prioritisation. And I think it is more a question about how we prioritise um, and how we understand the services that are important. And we can think about whether it is um, driven through deprivation or whether we think about uh, premature preventable mortality, those kind of things, the things that are killing people too soon and what we can do to prevent that. So understanding how we prioritise is really, really important. And again, that is about understanding people's health and wellbeing within their context. And for me, this is about how we can work alongside and with our communities to understand the lives people are living. And uh, Carol's point at the beginning around uh, growing populations as well, making sure we understand how our populations are growing into the future so that we can plan effectively, so that we can do that prioritization, uh, prioritization in a meaningful way. But we have to do it together. 
I think the strategy is here and it is it it's given us our our guiding light and it's there because it's pulled together our priorities from all the research and work that we've done but it's now how that applies to our populations and how we can really affect change thank you rob did you want to add anything um no, not particularly as and i think that's a really good answer i thought it, it's a really big challenge that uh any public sector organisation that's involved in the provision of care and support or, or the provision of any service, uh, we have constrained resources and there are difficult decisions to be made all of the time about what is the best way that we can use the, the, the pot of resource that we have, be that money or people or time, uh, in, in the best possible way. Um, uh from from the nhs perspective there is a there's a, a a very formal annual process that we would go through that's about setting priorities for the year um, understanding how we will be uh measuring and delivering those services in the best possible way for our communities um this this does set some priorities absolutely but those are things that we've identified from the needs of our population they're things that we've identified where we believe that they they will have the greatest impact uh in terms of uh improving the overall health and well-being of our populations um but but this this is a it is difficult thank you um francis would you like to ask your question Yes, my name is Francis Brown, South Reading Patient Voice. And my question or, or point to, to, for consideration is to do with the word priorities. We have the document, uh, the Bob ICP Strategic Priorities, which is its title, and it promptly starts talking about priorities, which in this session have been helpfully defined as areas for improvement. Now, I feel that, there's a, that these things are two different things. Areas for improvement is an accurate description and calling all of those areas of improvement, which are so many, a priority is to mislead, I think, the general public. So I'm just asking the group to consider the overuse of the word priorities. And that is my point. Thank you. Rob, you look like you want to speak. <laughs> um, thank you very much for your feedback. Uh, that is feedback that we've had from a number of different sources. Uh, if I were to be able to go back in time, uh, the first thing I would change would be the language of priorities um, uh, that we've used in here. So I think it's really helpful feedback um, and thank you for it. Thank you. Okay, um, moving back. Thank you, Francis. Um, moving back to the chat, um, I'm keen to understand how the core 20 plus five uh, children, young persons links into the strategy specifically around oral health. Um, Tracy. Yeah, I'm happy to start with that. Um, and thank you, Re really helpful question. Um, core 20 plus five, obviously the, the, the overarching one has been in place for some time now and has been a real drive um, around health and equalities that has been hugely welcomed um, following the pandemic. Um, and we have recently obviously seen the published version of having a more targeted approach around children and young people. Again, very much welcomed. The greatest impact we can have on tackling health inequalities is starting as early in life as possible. Hence, one of those themes of work is around maternal and uh, children's health so that we can make sure that everybody is getting the best start. Oral health is a real challenge and we know this to be the case. We know that um, we aren't seeing the same level as of health promotion interactions as we used to see in schools, uh, but with children's uh, oral health and also opportunities around conversations around oral health. We know that uh, tooth decay is a real challenge with uh, primary school age children and one that needs to be addressed. Um, we also know that there is a shortage of NHS placements. Uh, we see that more predominantly in adults rather than children. 
we would hope that most children are able to gain access to an NHS dentist and have regular checkups. And that's the key with it in terms of making sure that children are seen a dentist regularly and it is preventative care rather than corrective care. And there is a lot of misinformation um, that, that happens and we I think we need to get better at publicising oral health and some simple tricks around things. Uh, parents can often choose for the health of their child, pure fruit, fruit juice, for example, rather than sugar free squash, thinking that it's a healthier option. And often children may have fruit juice for, for their breakfast and then go and brush their teeth before they're in school. And what pure fruit juice does, it softens the enamel. So if you then go and brush your teeth straight after, you then brush away that softened enamel, which again is going to weaken teeth, which is going to mean that decay, decay happens. So there are some really simple uh, messages that we need to get out to try and help prevent childhood tooth, uh, childhood tooth decay. We do, as most health inequalities, see higher impact um, in areas of deprivation. And what is driving that? What do we need to do more in those spaces? So I think the core 20 um, plus five for children and young people is going to be a really good focus point to help us do these. But not only in terms of services, but how we can get messages out there to support parents and children um, within their, their own preventative care, particularly around oral health. So I think that that is a piece of work that uh, we are going to get started on from a public health point of view. Um, the, the burden of oral health is one that we need to get more focused on and, and make sure that we're protecting children's teeth into the future. Healthy milk teeth will lead to a uh, healthy second teeth and teeth for life, I think, should be an ambition. Thank you, Tracy. Um, Rob Beasley, did you want to add anything from a communications perspective, thinking about the messages Tracy's just talked about? Well, I'm sitting here thinking I didn't know that about orange juice. Uh, <laughs> thinking that was so I was thinking that some of that the public health messaging, of course, is is really vital. I, I think the, one of the key things about the, the draft strategy is that it does put a very strong focus on on uh, preventative interventions. And so many of those uh, interventions are based around uh, I mean, they become effective through um, clear communications and reaching people with clear messages, which uh, give them advice about how to behave and, and you know what what the better choices would be. And I think that's something which we can all we can all think that that's the the, the as the strategy is adopted and rolled out, there'll be a much greater focus on that uh, that area of work. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, there are a couple of uh, comments and feedback in the chat, which I won't review, um, but we will we will um, take those um, down as well. Um, I think the next question in the chat is um, how can you have a strategy without discussing the workforce? And I think that does <laughs> link up to one of the other comments. Um, about uh, the volunteers and, and and things so yes it's a question about workforce in the strategy please um rob bowen yeah happy to start um so again the the the, the workforce and and understanding some of the challenges around workforces is, is uh really really important we we uh the the way that we've tried to write the strategy is um is, as I said earlier, we, we've tried to describe the things that will make a difference to the populations uh, and to the people who live within the uh, the Bob area. So we we've tried to describe them from a uh, from a uh, that that sort of public perspective. Um, what what we are silent on in this version is the delivery plan um, and each of the different. Uh, organizations involved in the delivery of the strategy will need to be reflecting these uh, and part of that will be understanding actually what what uh, what are the things that we need to be doing differently with our workforce and and uh, how can we work together as a group of organizations to do more uh, for our workforce and with our workforce um, but one of the things that we are intending to do with the next iteration of the strategy is to absolutely recognise that there are a number of things that we do need to get right that sit alongside these priorities. So they're things like um, 
uh, making sure that we've got the right digital infrastructure and a good understanding of what it is that will uh, support some of the things um, that are required to make these services work better across different organizational boundaries. Workforce is really fundamental. Um, uh, and so the, there will be some information in here about uh, how we do intend to work uh, as a group of organizations, uh, including with the voluntary sector and, and with volunteers uh, to think as collaboratively as we can about supporting and, and working with our workforce. So there are a number of things that we, we recognize will need to be built into the next version of this, but this version was particularly focused on things that were around outcomes and uh, outcomes that we wanted to influence for the public. Thank you, Tracy. Would you like to come in there? Yeah, just to add to that, and of course, this strategy is is just one one strategy in terms of what's underpinning um, the delivery and transformation of healthcare into the future. Um, and there is a lot of work going on by uh, the registration bodies. We know that we have an aging workforce. We also know that these highly skilled jobs um, in clinical settings are not quick to train for. Um, and therefore, we know that we need to be aware of the skills gap that is emerging. But there's also wider issues in terms of how we attract and retain people within our local infrastructure. And some of that is things like housing costs and making sure that we've got key worker housing that's affordable, that will mean that people move into our area to, to live and work. Um, so all of those things need to be taken into account. We also know that um, we've seen an acceleration of people retiring over the past sort of 12 to 18 months, um, which has seen people exit the profession sooner than we thought. We are really aware of this and we're doing a lot of profile in terms of workforce and skill mix, as Rob says, other ways of working such as digitisation to try and make sure that people do have the health care um, in the future that they they need and deserve. Um, so it, it is something that is being worked on and talked about an awful lot and working across that whole system of place and training to try and make um, our, our health care jobs and as a profession one that's attracted to people to join. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, uh, Francis, would you like to come in again? You're on mute. Yeah, OK. Um, yes, if I can just uh, talk about digital infrastructure um, and the three main players, the NHS, the local authorities, and then the third sector. Um, I'm concerned about the digital infrastructure between the third sector and everybody else. It really doesn't exist. It needs to be built. And this this is a huge task, a really difficult task, and it's barely recognised. But it, my concern is the lack of it will hold us back. And the NHS plan is quite clear. We are very dependent on utilising the third sector. To do it, we need digital infrastructure, and we need to start by recognising that. Thank you. Thank you. Who would like to respond? Rob, would you like to? Or Bowen? Uh, yeah, yes, happy to. Um, so uh, absolutely recognise that point, Francis. So thank you for raising it. Um, uh, I'm not a digital expert at all, so I'm, I'm slightly out of my comfort zone to try, trying to trying to answer this, but I um, I know that lots of work is is being done to try and improve the join up uh, digitally between uh, the, as you say, the NHS organisations and NHS and local authority organisations. Um, honestly, I don't know very much about the join up with the voluntary sector or the VCSE sector. Um, uh, happy to try and find out more about that or, or provide that feedback into our digital teams. Um, but I think it's it's important to flag, so thank you. Thank you. Tracy or, or Rob Beasley, did you want to come in on that? Or? No, thank you. I think si similarly oh. to Rob, I'm, I'm not an expert on on uh, on sort of the digital infrastructure, but I would say that um, I think uh, there's an there's a need for investment in 
uh, digital technology across the health and care system. There's a range of opportunities that we know that we've got. For example, um, there was a panorama on TV a couple of weeks ago that highlighted the work that's been done um, by the John Radcliffe Hospital in Oxford around supporting people through a hospital at home program that is driven by digital technology. By having the digital technology in people's homes, it allows them to sort of be cared for um, at home remotely. Um, and so there's a, I think, a, a wide recognition that investment in digital technology is something which offers great opportunities. And I mean, I think one of the one of the uh, optimistic signs is that it's through things like a an integrated care partnership that we we will be able to identify where that investment needs to be made. Thank you, and thank you, Francis. Um, moving back to the chat, um, are you looking at other ICTS integrated care systems for best practice, which are the best for integration and improvement? Um, I'm going to have to put that to you, Rob. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, yes, there are lots of ways that we're trying to learn from different systems, um, uh, and, and there are strengths and weaknesses that lots of different systems have. Um, uh in in terms of best practice um it's it's hard to call out a few um uh west yorkshire is often named as a, a sort of leading exemplar in terms of the the sort of integration journey and how far they've gone in terms of integration um uh there are some really uh good examples that are happening in surrey and in sussex um uh but, but actually, when we talk about integration, it's easy to think only at system level. Uh, I think if we look at some of the way that our organisations are working, there is some really good practice, again, that we are sharing and could be sharing uh, more with, with other systems uh, about how we do things locally. Um, so, for example, in, in Berkshire West, uh, there's a, a really good history of uh, the, the way in which uh, our services and support for our populations has been planned and delivered collaboratively um, through a, a, a unified team that come together uh, to, to discuss and um, discuss and plan how, how best we can do that sort of integration bit and the join up uh, that all makes a difference for uh, the people who are receiving care. Um, but there are there are various different networks that that we're a part of, and through different professional groups that we're a part of, uh, that that allow for a good a good sharing of understanding and learning. Thank you. I'm actually going to um, I'll come to you in a moment, Tracy. We're just going to bring in another question as it's on the same theme, um, which is how, how will Bob Buck, Buckinghamshire, Oxfordshire, and Berkshire West be working with other integrated care boards and partnerships, especially bordering um, areas and the broader southeast region. Is there any movement to share priorities with other integrated care boards to prevent geographical inequalities and to prove access, efficiency, and seamlessness? If so, what bodies are doing this work? Tracy, can I come to you? Have to take them off mute, don't it? Yes, um, that there, there, there are, and um, we have. Um, I mean, people will know the complexity of of different borders, and they they don't always match. So NHS borders are different to police boundaries, are different to local authority boundaries, and all of these cross over. But what that does do is give um, space for natural conversation, where priorities can be shared from a public health point of view that he, that happens frequently so i certainly face across the whole of berkshire and um, we do a lot of conversations um with berkshire east uh, we look at where we can work together on key topics at scale so one of those for example um is not 19s another one is suicide prevention um there are a range of issues that we work at a, a, a berkshire footprint then from a policing footprint, I work right across the Thames Valley where conversations are had, where we look at harms and risks at a community level that may impact health and wellbeing. Um, so that is a, a different footprint again. So there is there is natural 
um, opportunities to have those. Um, what is common across all ICSs, ICPs and ICBs across the country is this razor sharp focus on tackling health inequalities. And that's happening in several ways. It's looking at the drivers, which invariably is deprivation, um, ethnicity, but also things like gender and, and other aspects, particular health conditions um, that may lead to um, health inequalities, but also health equity. So how equitable is access to good health care? So these really common strands are being talked about in all of these forums. So we have these in common about increasing life expectancy, but more importantly, about how we close the gap in the number of years that people live in poor health. Um, so this is about improving healthy life years. And again, this is something that is common across the country. And this is driven by national strategic objectives, such as the core, core 20 plus five, but also national health and equality strategies um, and disparity papers. Um, so although we don't have a, a, a national strategy around this, what we do have is national principles and framework that all ICSs and ICBs are working to about improving health inequalities, um, about health equity and about health justice. So I think whichever ICB board you sat in, you would hear those conversations. Thank you. Any any further comments, Rob or Bob? Uh, not from me. I think I'd only repeat things that Tracy yeah. said. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for the two questions. Um, there are uh, two further questions in the chat. So um, if we can cover those before uh, it's time to finish. Um, the first one is how much is being done with businesses, economic development agencies and the local enterprise partnership to deliver digital improvement? Are there any public sector services using their leverage in commissioning using social value to tackle this? Happy to start. I think it's yeah. a brilliant, I, I, brilliant I think question. Tracy will probably give a clearer answer of that okay. than, than I will at this point from a local authority perspective. Thank you. Yeah, abs absolutely brilliant question. I'm not sure I've got a, a equally brilliant brilliant answer. Um, but yeah, gosh, what a, a, it's almost an instruction that is, isn't it? And, and uh, one that we need to do. So the local enterprise partnerships are involved. There are forums where we have um, joint planning and discussion uh, using local enterprise partnerships. From a public health point of view, we've started planning our work um, in, um, in three approaches, and that's the social, environmental and economic. So absolutely everything we do, we start and think of it through those three lenses. So we're not just looking at things purely um, as has been the case previously is predominantly been through through that social health and well-being lens but bringing in that economic and environmental is absolutely crucial i mean the the environmental conversation hasn't come through strongly today but obviously sustainability um food poverty and all of those kind of things is really important but that economic space is absolutely vital when we think about the social gradient and the link between health and wealth it's absolutely crucial if we've got a population or or particularly people of a workforce age that aren't in good health, the amount of loss to the economy through people not being able to work is huge. Um, equally, if we don't have good economic infrastructure that's enabling good workforce development, again, we're going to see a real impact on health. So having that really close relationship between health and wealth is absolutely vital. I don't think we do it as well as we should. I don't think that conversation is as close as it could be. Um, but I think that that question almost needs to be uh, one of, it, maybe not in this strategy, but certainly uh, a, a public health strategic priority in terms of how we develop this into the future. Thank you, Tracy. Rob, did you want to add anything? Uh, I, again, I don't. I don't think there's a huge amount more that I can add. Um, I, th I think it is absolutely an aspiration that we are uh, doing more. Uh, so, so there's a term that's used around uh, anchor institutions and, and trying to understand what more the uh, big employers within our areas can be doing uh, to promote social and economic development. Uh, 
Um, and some of that is simply around employment, but some of that is absolutely some of the partnerships that we might develop as, as Tracy's described, um, but also some of the partnerships that we might develop with some of our research and innovation institutions that we've got spread across the geography um, and, and trying to do more to sort of stimulate some of that uh, that economic and social development that should be having a benefit for all of our populations. Thank you and thank you for the yeah. question. Um, really good question. Add, add a question to that if that's possible. I realise I just suddenly okay. wind my hand up. Um, is that the economic and social development aspirations are not seen in silo from the community and environmental because often economic discussions happen over here with this group of people, then there's a discussion with the BCS over here with these people, then often there's another load of people over here talking about education, which might feed back into the stuff that happens in the economic stuff, but doesn't always link directly into community support because no one has a careers advisor anymore because they can't afford it. And I think actually it's the integration between sectors. I'm passionate about this because it's my, my life, my job. Um, that's what can actually bring sort of co-produced solutions instead of talking about these things in silos. OK, soapbox done. Thank Lorraine, you. I, Lorraine, I'd love you with my team. If ever you want to <laughs> divert into public health, there is a chair for you. Thank you. OK, um, the last question. Um, in the chat, have you considered looking at ways of enabling PPGs to communicate with a wider range of consenting patients at their practices? At my practice, I can contact 20% of patients. I know of no others that have the same reach. Um, I think that's one for you, Rob Beasley, please. Uh, so I'm not sure if I'm going to answer that specifically, but I am going to say that uh, I know that um, we are looking to um, increase the funding and support for um, for uh, uh, patient participation groups. Um, we're looking to uh, provide, so in Oxfordshire, for example, we currently, the, the clinical commissioning group in Oxfordshire funded the uh, Oxfordshire Health Watch to support um, the development and communication between and with um, the patient participation groups uh, across that county. And we are looking to um, fund uh, health watches across the system to do perform a, a similar role. Um, Sarah probably hasn't seen this yet, but I think we have, we are, there is a proposal in the pipeline for around that funding. And so, I, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, so it, it is uh, something that we want to use and improve and develop. Thank you. Um... Any further comments, Rob or, or Tracy, on that? Not for me. No. Thank you. OK, so um, we're just coming to the end of, of our hour. Um, is there, um, before we um, ask Rob Bone for the next steps, um, Tracy, Rob, is there anything else that you wanted to, to say or add um, before we close? Nothing from me apart from huge thanks. I think there's, uh, there are other questions in the chat, so I'll go through. I think really, really helpful discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, similarly, I, I, I particularly like the social value question. That was very good. <laughs> Thank you. OK, so um, uh, Rob, anything from you and, and what are the next steps? The, the survey's open until the 29th of January, which is Sunday. Um, the link is in the chat. Um, then, then what happens, Rob? Uh, so I, th I think there's a slide on next steps. If not, I can just explain. Um, so the there we go. Uh, so as thank you, Sarah, as you said, the the engagement period ends this Sunday. So that's the formal period of engagement. Uh, the reason why we've got to close it formally is because we're trying to produce a uh, a report uh, that will summarise the feedback that we've had through this period. Uh, that we then need to make some decisions about how we reflect into a final version of the strategy. Um, I think it's important to say that we don't stop listening. Uh, we're really keen to continue to have people's views. Um, and uh, so, so if, if people continue to have views, we we are keen to continue to get those. But uh, if, if they're to be included in that sort of formal engagement report, we need them back by the 29th of January. Uh, 
will then be iterating the strategy. So there's been some really helpful feedback from this session and we've had a number of other sessions and people have provided us feedback through other channels as well. Uh, we're, we're trying to understand the best ways that we can reflect that feedback uh, to make improvements to the document and the proposals that we've put out there. Uh, the intention is that we are producing a final version of this that will be uh, looked at and signed off by the Integrated Care Partnership in March, uh, following which it, it will be a public document that will uh, that anybody can access and, and have a look at. Um, the whole point of this strategy is that it then starts to influence the way in which we work, the way in which we plan and deliver services. So that's something that's ongoing um, from an NHS perspective. We're sort of in the middle of that cycle of planning at the moment, and this is very much something that's uh, feeding an input uh, or being an input into that process. So so it's really, really valuable for us. So thank you from me as well. Uh, been a great conversation. Thank you. Um, so thank you to Rob, Tracy and Rob, and, and thank you for the, your participation. Obviously, we'll take the, the comments in the chat and things as well. Um, so thank you for your time today um, and uh, have a good weekend. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, thank all. you, Sarah. Thank you.